Are you suggesting that the, the judge was not awake during the trial? I'm not saying he fell asleep, but there were occasions when I could see that he was not getting the point that I was extracting from the, from the witness. What about the strain there was for you as the judge with this trial? I think it is a, it's a physical strain, but then as an advocate at the bar, one had got used to it, because time and again you have long cases. You, you really have got to keep all your faculties um, about you. So to some extent, uh, you're, you're used to it. I mean, it, it's part of your training, undoubtedly. It was a, a new experience for, for Mr. Irving. But one of the, as it were, mitigating factors in this particular trial uh, was that the subject matter was so absorbing. Mr. Irving manifest is an extremely intelligent and well-read and was very good on his feet. I'm bound to say that I thought that Mr. Irving handled his case with great skill and ability. And I think everyone was impressed uh, at the way he, he represented himself, which is a very difficult thing to do uh, in any context, not least the context of the Irving case. And what did Richard Rampton make of Irving as an adversary? Certainly he was very courteous to me, never offensive, or always acknowledged me and, and so on and so forth. As an opponent, I'll be quite frank, I, I was surprised how unimpressive he was as an advocate. He didn't seem to me to have grasped the strength of the case against him. I think in the second week of the trial, Richard Ranton asked him, Mr. Irving, have you ever checked these documents at the Auschwitz archives? And he said, no, I'm banned from going to Auschwitz. It's like the casinos in Las Vegas. They don't let the big winners in. I think for him, it was a game. If it was, it was a pretty horrendous kind of game to play. I've always been taught that no matter what the outcome of the game, it's how you play the game that matters. On the last day, on April the 11th last year, I came into the courtroom knowing the result of the trial, and I went over to Richard Rampton, who was preening himself in the front row of this packed courtroom, and I put my hand out to him, and I said, Mr. Rampton, and he said, yes. And I said, well done. And he turned his back on me, and that really hurt. I thought, I, I've not been dealing with ordinary English people here. These are people who are operating in the pay of a foreign power. <laughs> well, I don't remember <clears throat> turning my back on him. I don't remember sh shaking hands with him, but then I don't normally shake hands with my opponents. It's not that's a kind of false, let's all play cricket together attitude to uh, litigation. Litigation, particularly in, in a case like this, is a substitute for war. Rampton unfortunately became emotionally involved in a way that he shouldn't have allowed himself to. Became emotionally involved is certainly true, there's no question about that, in a way that he shouldn't have allowed himself to is bunk. This doesn't mean that that infects the way you conduct the case. At the end of the eight-week trial, Mr Justice Gray took a further month to deliver his verdict. In a lengthy written judgment, he found in favour of Deborah Lipstadt and produced a devastating condemnation of David Irving. Mr. Justice Gray said, Irving has, for his own ideological reasons, persistently and deliberately misrepresented and manipulated historical evidence. That Irving had portrayed Hitler in an unwarrantedly favourable light, especially in relation to his treatment of the Jews. And that Irving is an active Holocaust denier, associates with neo-Nazis, and is an anti-Semite and a racist. In the event, Mr. Justice Gray had gone significantly further and Deborah Lipstadt in her book, and his findings were widely hailed as a landmark judgment. Once again, David Irving sees it differently. Uh, I think in my obituary it will rate less than two lines, if I can make so bold. I think it's uh, one of those rocks you stumble over through life. <laughs> I'm indestructible, I think. As had happened throughout the case, David Irving's interpretation of events was diametrically opposed to Deborah Lipstadt's. This was her reaction to the judgment by Mr. Justice Gray in the case that had become the trial of David Irving. I hadn't expected such a sweeping judgment. I was really profoundly overjoyed when I read what he had to say. But a lot of that joy was tempered by a sense that this never should have been. And more than that, that a man who spreads such hatred and, and lies and is such a distorter of history, had gotten his comeuppance, was overwhelming to me. 
it's lucky the Twin Towers hadn't been shot down by then. Otherwise, I'd have been blamed of that as well. <laughs> Justice Gray's judgment. The judgment was so over the top that it totally missed its effect. I think Judge Gray needs lessons in how to write really wicked prose. The Irving Trial was written and presented by Michael Cockrell. It was produced by Charlie Potter and Bruce Hyman and was an above-the-title production for BBC Radio 4. Now, it's time for Shelf Lives. Tonight, the story of the rubbish skip. Nigel Kennedy, Cassidy, I beg your pardon, Nigel Cassidy discovers how business is brisk for skip hire companies thanks to Britain's DIY boom. The moment we saw this skip, my eyes lit up. It's, it's really exciting because you just don't know because what you're going to find. And look there. I mean, it's got a four-piece... Frying pan, frying set. pan set. Someone could very easily use this. This is the story of what must be one of the least glamorous objects on Earth. The yeah. skip, that unlovely but essential rubbish container that magically appears in the street as more and more people have work done. It's at the heart of the waste management industry, which is worth over four billion pounds a year. That's half a percent of all national output. Nobody even knows quite how it got its name. A skip was originally a bucket, a large container or a cage used in mining and quarrying. Pass one on the street and it's hard to resist taking a peek inside. Or in the case of self-confessed skip lover Neil Bell, having a rummage. Um, ironing board. Ironing board. If someone needs an ironing board, I personally wouldn't use it. Hand over a fee of up to £100 or more, that's including permit, landfill tax and VAT, then you too yeah. can have one of these oversized dustbins parked outside your door. From then on, it's a race. Can you fill it with the now unwanted contents of your garden, your shed or your life before half the neighbourhood beats you to it? Mind you, if you're lucky, Neil Bell might help out by nabbing some of your rubbish. He's an artist and film director from North London who can't abide waste. He's always on the lookout for bits and pieces to turn into sculptures or just to use at home. People want to get rid of things. They don't really care who takes it as long as someone takes it away. They don't want to see it ever again. And the notion of about escapes is also about cleansing. Just cleansing the flat or your car or whatever. You just have to get rid of it any which way. And the best form is a skip. So where do these mass instruments of cleansing come from in the first place? Well, at least 5,000 are made every year by a firm in Derby, with the entirely descriptive, if slightly unromantic, name of skip units. Not that life there is without excitement. Skip units once had an order for one painted in hot pink. Another customer even wanted one made in stainless steel, with perforations to strain out jellyfish. Don't ask. Alan Powis is the sales director. What you have is a hole surrounded by steel. It has uh, a base and four sides, and basically that's a skip. Oversimplistic, of course, but it is a very simple piece of equipment. Our own market research suggests that a skip would be about eight years old by the time it's disposed of. The kind of skip that you would hire to put at the end of your garden to clear your garden rubbish could probably be bought, if you're prepared to sit on the phone and make hundreds of phone calls, for as little as 280 pounds, 300 pounds. Skips started clanging down our city streets in the late 1950s. Barry Dennis is deputy chief executive of the main industry body, the Environmental Services Association. He says contractors soon realised the time they could save shifting waste from building sites. It was post-war and uh, there, were, there was a great deal of development going on and waste was being put out in the streets for these developments. Prior to the skips, you had two men on with a tipper lorry.